Good afternoon. My name is Megan Nolan, and on behalf of the Adelphi Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy, we'd like to welcome you to our Meet the Author series. There's three parts to tonight's meeting. First, we're going to have Dr. Mills give us an overview of his book, Debating Relational Psychoanalysis, John Mills and His Critics. And then we're going to ask Dr. Newworth to join Dr. Mills in talking about the main tenets of his book. And then lastly, we will open it up to the audience for all of you to share any questions or comments in regards to the topic that we've been talking about. I'd like to thank Dr. Mills and Dr. Newworth for their contribution to our field and for today's presentation. I also see that our Dean, Dr. Jacques Barber is here. Thank you for supporting the presenters and our program. I'm sure today's presentation will be a real treat for all of us. So at this point, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mills and Dr. Newworth. Dr. Mills is a Canadian philosopher, psychoanalyst, and retired clinical psychologist. He's a faculty member here at the postgraduate program in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy at Adelphi University. He's an honorary professor of the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalysis at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom, and is the Emeritus Professor of Psychology and Psychoanalysis at the Adler Graduate Professional School, Toronto, Canada, where he had taught for over 20 years. He's a recipient of numerous awards for his scholarship. His author, he is the author and or editor to over 25 books in philosophy, psychoanalysis, psychology, and cultural studies. Dr. Mills is an internationally recognized scholar, teacher, and cultural critic, award-winning author who maintains an active writing schedule and lectures worldwide. So without further ado, I'm going to ask that you, Dr. Mills, start sharing with us your ideas and thoughts behind your current book, Debating Relational Psychoanalysis. Thanks. Well, thank you very much uh, to my gracious hosts for inviting me and uh, for Joe to be so kind to uh, hopefully put me through some tough questions. But um, I, let me start by saying that I hope this is the very last time I'm going to be talking about this topic. I am uh, pretty much uh, uh, baked. <laughs> Um, but I hope to go out with one last bang, and um, that's why I, I put this book together. It, um, it wouldn't have really been published, um, and neither would, have my, would my book Conundrums been published if it wasn't for an incident that happened many years ago. Uh, but I'll, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, the structure of this book so you have the story. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I got my uh, doctoral degree, my first one in, in Chicago, and I was uh, training um, as a, I got my PsyD degree at a professional school. And um, I very much um, was drawn to psychoanalytic thinking and teachers at the time. And I was fortunate enough to have a number of supervisors who had trained with a number of uh, luminaries, such as um, Bettelheim and uh, Kohut and um, Merton Gill and um, Robert Langs, uh, a, no a number of different perspectives. Uh, and before, I, before Merton Gill became my supervisor, um, I had, um, been attracted to the relational literature that was coming out uh, at that time. So we, you know, this was late 80s. We were already reading uh, Greenberg and, and Mitchell's first book. We were reading the relational concepts that Steve Mitchell published in 88. Um, and, and so it was, it was exciting. I, I remember feeling I, I identified much more with these types of thinkers at the time. But then um, I went, uh, I, I got an academic post after I graduated. And then I, I actually decided to go back and I got a fellowship in, in philosophy at, to go to Vanderbilt University. So I had um, gone back for a second degree. And at that time I was completely out of the 
picture. I, I was not reading uh, the psychoanalytic literature except for, for basically Freud um, and his great, you know, his collected works, um, which became part of my scholarly specialty. But when I came back, um, you know, after learning this whole new discipline, I, I didn't get a job as an academic. I did not get hired in philosophy. I did not get hired in psychology. I was competing with hundreds of people. And so um, the chips fell and I had to fall back on my original training. So I went into the hospitals. And then uh, a few years later, I went into my own private practice. Well, this is when I started reading the contemporary literature again. And, and I, because I had, you know, I was reading it through the lens of philosophy, I noticed how a number of um, contemporary writers were, were really not representing the philosophical field correctly, or at least they were not, um, they weren't um, uh, as detailed as I would be accustomed to think. And they were annexing concepts here and there, and that's when I decided. Well, I'm going to I'm going to start critiquing these uh, these concepts that people were doing, and that led to my first article called "A Critique of Relational Psychoanalysis." Um, now, little did I know at the time what shitstorm I was going to get into, but. Um, I, I remember vividly, though, getting one of the blind reviewers um, scathing um, rejection of, of the paper, and the other two uh, were positive in, in the blind review process. The scathing review uh, stands out because it said something like, I'll paraphrase, um, the first two pages were great, but by the time I got to the third, I threw the whole thing in the trash. And so all I could say to the editor, which is Joe Reppin at the time, um, that uh, this reviewer obviously is biased and they should not have any um, uh, credibility as, as a review. But I, I made revisions based on the other two reviewers. It was published. But before it was published, I gave a talk at the Division 39 conference on portions of the paper. And, and this is where, um, you know, I'm a young man at this point. I'm, I'm a kind of a kid, you know, I'm mid thirties at that time, whatever it may be. And I um, was not well received by uh, certain people in the audience, uh, namely Jody Davies, uh, Neil Altman and Erwin Hoffman. And this led to, um, uh, um, you know, some, I would just say disagreements, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it, it, uh, it led to me realizing I've stepped into, you know, you know, stepped on some political toes. And when the, when the article came out later that year, then I had a number of people writing responses to it. And, and then the, the what's custom, what was customary, uh, the journal allows the the main author to have a response to those kind of um, uh, critics. So after I um, read their their uh, critique of my critique, I offered another critique of their critique. But I also mentioned what happened at the conference, where I was more or less verbally accosted by my colleagues. And then that led to a scandal. And the scandal was um, I was to be censored, um, but these three people were allowed to have the final word. And so they got to publish um, their response to my, my response to my response to the critics response. But I, I wasn't allowed uh, to, uh, to have any say. Uh, they got to have the last word, so to speak. And this was um, uh, this is where the publications committee had, according to Joe Reppin, had uh, shanghaied the whole process and they asserted a certain political will and he, um, uh, he, he likely caved under the pressure. Anyway, 
all of this is to say that I would not, I went on to write a book called Conundrums on the a critique of contemporary psychoanalysis. I would never have written that book if uh, this hadn't happened. But after that, that book got a lot of attention. It got a lot of reviews. Um, I got interviews. And, um, and then it, it led to um, a, a, a group uh, from IARP out in Israel that um, organized a international conference on, on my book. And so I went out there and I was critiqued by a panel of, um, of, of five scholars uh, at, uh, at, a, at this event. And um, it was very enjoyable for me. It was also very difficult. Uh, I was being uh, led into the lion's den, so to speak. And yet I made uh, friends and um, it's, that led to the publication of the conference in um, uh, the periodicals. And that, uh, that came out in Psychoanalytic Perspectives, which is a relational journal. So um, I decided uh, at that point, um, this was worthy enough to put together, to, to cobble together for historical reasons in this present book that I call Debating Relational Psychoanalysis. So that, that's, the, that's the 20 year story behind how this happened. Um, uh, so I won't, I won't go over everything, obviously I can't, um, but you know, my, my main focus was really interested in looking at the philosophical underpinnings of contemporary theory. And at the time my first article came out, um, I was looking at certain trends. So whether it be relational trend, intersubjectivity theory, uh, and hermeneutics tend to be the, uh, the main writers. But I would also throw in there or lump in their postmodern thinking. Um, so I was interested in looking at how, um, what were the philosophical uh, foundations or undergirdings that was driving relational and intersubjective and postmodern authors to write about. Um, and I, I was also interested in the theoretic relation to more traditional or classical thought and in critiquing um, the divergences and differences and uh, emendations that were happening um, in terms of clinical implications for therapeutic practice. And, and then also the potential political uh, and ethical implications of what uh, authors were writing about. And my view was then to try to offer some consilience between these different broad perspectives. Um, but anyway, uh, some of the nuanced critiques, I more or less didn't hold back uh, my thoughts about. And, and this was, I think, were, were bones of contention for certain people. Now, now you have to keep in mind, a philosopher is trained to think very critically and to argue. That's what I was trained to do. That's what I was expected to do. And, and that's why, you know, intellectual, um, you know, uh, ecstasies can occur when you get excited about certain topics. So, um, However, people were taking just critique uh, as personal assaults, uh, going against their ideas, going against them, um, when I never intended for, uh, for any bad feelings to happen. I, it's just that I needed to point out certain things. And, and the one thing that, um, uh, you know, that I, I feel was the, the relational community in general is just not fair to uh, the fidelity of Freud's texts. So, you know, showing how, um, you know, classical theory, such as the nature of drives, the primacy of the unconscious, um, and a, a number of other, uh, what we call universals, meaning aspects of mind and culture that are universal to all people, were, were rather being displaced 
uh, with, with some of the relational thinking, such as um, when you commit to a theory of language and that language is the basis of, of, your, of, of all things, um, you've displaced the notion of embodiment. You've displaced displace the notion of, uh, let's say, you know, drives, the triva, um, and structural theory. And, and when, you when you privilege the inner subjective realm, you privilege consciousness that is the foundation for everything. And, and, and so whoever, whoever was writing these things, starting with Greenberg, Mitchell, et cetera, um, and then leading into a linguistic turn, let's say, uh, you know, Don, Donald Stern in particular, um, at the time I was reading, you know, it challenges these, um, uh, you know, these metaphysical and epistemological views that are uh, often part of um, psychoanalysis as a human science. And, and so um, when you say everything is uh, determined by language uh, or discourse or speech act or, uh, or, gram or you know, grammatical relativism, so to speak, um, you, you're not considering how that, you know, shuts down um, other possibilities such as the notion of uh, objectivity or the notion of uh, that there's an objective reality or truth or, or, or certain epistemological or metaphysical positions that we would often just assume to be operative. So anyway, I won't bog everybody down, but because I could just blab forever. But um, the whole th the whole thought was to look at these things and then to um, uh, provide, in some ways, a corrective. So in this final book, I have an introductory chapter where I I'm talking about new directions, or you know, the future of revisioning relational psychoanalysis and what I think that the field could do if it wants to um, uh, you know, improve upon its theoretical edifice and its, and, you know, its clinical uh, theory as well. Let me just then wrap up then with that I think that the relational turn towards self-critique can only really improve the, the, the field. Um, because the minute you, you start looking at where your blind spots are, where your shortcomings are in theory, that you engage in a critical dialogue with your fellow um, uh, uh, you know, friends, colleagues, clinicians, then you're going to lead to new shifts, new developments, and novelty that you're not going to have if you just remain a friendly, uh, you know, the coterie of people that, that just like to hear their own ideas repeated without having anything uh, questioning it. Great. So I, I'll stop with that.